the drawing of God. No one comes to the Son except the Father draw them. What an interesting statement. You'll find that recorded in the sixth chapter of St. John. Turn there in your Bibles if you would, please. The word drawn is just a little bit stronger in the Greek as well as the Hebrew than the English. It means even drag, if you would. As a matter of fact, the Greek specifically, the better translation would be drag. However, to understand that statement, you must understand that God doesn't drag someone that he doesn't control. But that is to say one of his election, one that in the first earth age, which we're going to go just a little deeper here on for some, be that as it may. But uh, if they, as it is written in Romans chapter 8, along about verse uh, 29, 30, if they were justified in the first earth age, he can do whatever he wants to with them here. And, um, and because of the fact that they were justified. So he, there are two ends to the spectrum of salvation, free will and destiny. Those with a destiny are sent to prepare salvation for those with free will, to be servants of the living God. Therefore, we can begin to understand then why no one can come to the Son except the Father draw him. Now I will add to that as we go through this uh, lecture uh, to solidify it, and this is why there is much misunderstanding about uh, some of the statements of our Father, such as Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, I chose you before the foundations of this earth. Well, wow, what a statement. Or as he would say to Jeremiah in chapter 1 of Jeremiah th down through verse 4, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. I chose you then. When was that? Well, it was in the first earth age, of course, before Satan rebelled. And then he says, while you were in the womb, I chose you as a prophet. So he knew him. He knew what he was capable of. He knew that he was bound to God through love. Why? Because he loved God. The, throne, the strongest force in the world is love. And love will drag you. It will bind you. And it's a good thing. Not, not in a negative sense, but causing you to serve him. Why? Because you love him. That is his drawing or most usually the way he brings that forth. Uh, the word, um, let's, let's pick it up if we may in the sixth chapter here. Let's go with, let's pick it up with, they, they were murmuring because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. All right. That, that, would, that would be hard to understand. What, what do you mean? You're, it, you're the son of Joseph and Mary, supposedly we believe. How could it be you came down from heaven as the bread of life? Okay. And it would be quite a step, and, but um, it is scriptural. It is recorded in both the Old and the New Testament. It is written, and so it is. Chapter 6 of the great book of St. John. Let's pick it up with verse 43. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. How could this be? 44. No man. Now, now let me repeat that. No man, there's no gender in that, no man or woman can come to me except, there's a condition here, except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. The last day, of course, is the time of the election. Draw is helkos in the Greek. And it means to drag. Nobody can come to me unless the Father drag them. Father's in control, and if he must drag you, sometimes he'll get a little rough with you. If you don't follow him when he calls and so forth, he's gonna, he may wool you around if you're one of his elect to get in the traces. Why? Because he needs you to, he can get along without you. But he must stay in heaven till his enemies are made his footstool. 
Therefore, there are teachers and leaders. Doesn't make them any better than anyone else. That God chose. Why? Because He knew He could trust them. He knew they would be loyal through love. Therefore, He drags them. And I'll document before we finish this lecture that the thing He uses to drag them is love. You, when you love Him, you cannot help but serve Him. If you, if you get out of sorts, He will still drag you. He, he'll he'll uh, let you rough yourself up until you finally wake up and say, Lord, let me kiss that paddle and let's get with it. <laughs> okay, So that's the binding tie between us and our Father is the love for Him and for what He's doing for the rest of the children in this earth. You know, everybody has a chance at salvation. Let me tell you something. There is a movement in the world that's trying to drive Christians, Protestants especially, to doubt what they have been taught, it ain't going to happen. You know, Christians will uh, put up with scorpions until they move in and begin to bother them. Then we stomp them. Never press or push Christians past their love in Christianity. But there is a move on, and you're going to see in this coming year a drive more toward it. Snickering at Christianity, snickering at Protestantism, making light of, you know. Um, using law. I got some bad news for them. We're going to have judges put in place that's going to spoil their plan. But they're still going to try. And uh, Christians need to be more alert into their obligations and duty to Almighty God and be faithful to that. Nobody can come to the Son except the Father draw them. Draw them with that love. That, that is, uh, if you stop and think, that's kind of common sense. How did you meet your mate? You, you may not, you know, you may have, first time you saw him, you might have thought, hey, what, what a mess up, you know? Because who can define love? Okay. Because love just happens in your heart. And, and you really have no choice in it, you know? Once it grabs you and begins to draw you, it doesn't matter. When you love someone, hey, you're stuck with them, okay? Basically. But that's good because love binds. And love ties. And love causes one to appreciate. One, uh, each, we appreciate each other even with our faults. And don't ever think you don't have some pretty bad faults. There's a lot of us, you know, then don't be a nitpicker. You know, that's, oh my goodness, I just don't like the way he opens his toothpaste. Well, you know, that's really a serious thing in life, isn't it? You know, I mean, as long as he doesn't slop it all over the place, of course. But, but love really binds and love pulls together. And love is such a forgiving thing, true love. That's what God deals with you with, is loving him. Satan is in this world stronger than ever, and he's going to turn away people as much as he can. Some might think I'm digressing, digressing, and then that last was not planned for this lecture. Maybe somebody needed it. I don't know. Let's get on with the lecture. Verse 45. It is written, the prophet in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God, every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. There it's explained. Well, where's that? Well, it's written in the prophets. He tells you. The way Christ taught, if you're lazy and don't check it out, you're going to be missing something. We'll check it out in just a little bit. Well, what's written? What does it mean? Well, we'll find out in a little bit. But let's continue this thought, okay? Um, God has a way of touching people and bringing them to Him. 46, 
Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Why? Because if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Why? He was Emmanuel, God with us. 47. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. What a beautiful thought. He loves you that much. You know, we're not perfect, and we couldn't stay perfect enough to to inherit eternal life. And He died as a sacrifice to the Father for us. That there would be stop points in your life where you could say, Whoa, I want to change. I want forgiveness. I want my sins forgiven. And, um, and when you approach Him, you don't have to, you know, you don't, you don't even have to approach people. He's your Father. He's the closest relative you've got. All you have to do is go to Him and say, You know what I've done. Please forgive me and help me to do better. He'll do it. Okay? And that's the way eternal life comes in, through that love. 48, I am the bread of life. Now you're going to have to take from the Old Testament the manna that fell, the bread that fell in the wilderness. It would spoil. They ate of it and died. But He's the bread of life that if you partake of it, you have eternal life. Verse 49, Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Uh, uh, And it would be just like the bread He had given them the day before when He fed 5,000 from the few loaves. Hey, they're going to die. That wasn't the bread of life. That was a miracle He performed documenting that He was the Savior, that He was Yeshua, that He was say, uh, being fully translated Yahweh's Savior. Verse 15, This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. 51, I am the living bread which, come down, which came down from heaven if If any man eat this of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. No one comes to the Father except he draw them. But Father provided that bread that anyone with free will could partake of that bread and have eternal life. Is it a physical saying we're saying here? No, it's spiritual. Um, What the bread, see if you remember these words. The, The word became flesh and lived among us. I I will give, what I will give is, that that I will give is my flesh. The flesh became the living word. Go back to chapter 1 in St. John here real quickly. I'm, I'm just, I'm not checking you out, but I just want to make sure you remember it. Verse um, 14. Don't ever forget this. Verse 14 reads, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And there you have it. He loved you enough that the Word became flesh. He came to this earth whereby uh, you didn't have to have faith only. They saw Him. He walked with them. He participated In daily life, when they were hungry, he was hungry. And when they were cold, he was cold. By that I mean the Word, the living Word, Yeshua, became flesh to show us that God himself could do it in the flesh, only there would be a big difference. He didn't sin. He showed us how to do it right. Is it possible for us to? I think probably not. But He made it possible for us because He brought the bread to us. It's spiritual, I'm speaking. For through love, 
for him, that he would do this for us. And through the drawing of God's election, the free will have the opportunity to partake of that bread and through love enter into an everlasting life. It's part of God's plan. But he said, hey, it's already written. Haven't you read it? Let's go there. It's uh, Isaiah chapter 54. Turn there with me. Let's, let's not, if Jesus gives you a home study, uh, don't, don't pass it over or you're going to fall up short as a student of God's Word and be um, drifting around in the dark. Isaiah chapter 54. To many of you, this is a special chapter. And don't let me lose you now. Hang on for a minute. I'm going to give you a little side trip to introduce this chapter. As Jesus was carrying the cross up the hill of Golgotha to Golgotha, he said to the women that were standing by, daughters of Jerusalem, I'm quoting from Luke 23, Weep not for me, weep for yourselves. For the day will come when it will be said, Blessed are the barren and the paps that never gave suck. That's a spiritual saying. It means it's the same as in Mark chapter 13 where he would repeat, uh, woe to those that are with child when I return. He didn't mean a mother with a child in her womb. That's a blessing. He meant those that are spiritually impregnated by the false Messiah and take part in the apostasy. Those that stay barren and true to the true Christ. He, the Christ that carried that cross. The Christ that was crucified for us our sins, that on forgiveness we have that freedom through His love, that forgiveness. And uh, this is why the, the chapter 54 in the Old Testament begins reading, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. What that means is those that hoard after the false Messiah. There's just not very many that remain barren spiritually and uh, will be deceived when the false Messiah says, I've come to fly you out of here. I've come to rapture you. You know, there's not many places in the Word you'll find that it's blessed to be barren. It's always just the opposite. You're blessed when you carry. So that to the wise means we're speaking spiritual. You mean God's talking to us like a husband? Well, skip on down to verse 5. For thy maker is thine husband. You stay true to him. The Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. Universal dominion. There is no other. So don't let some sneaky Pete come sneaking in, claiming to be. All right? For there will come. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith the Lord. At the apostasy you're going to be snickered at because you don't accept the false Messiah. 7. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. At the apostasy, you're going to kind of be on your... You don't have to worry. Let me, let me make that very clear. Because your love in Him gives you a, a little help. And a little help from God is a bunch. And you've got to have faith to know and believe that. Nothing ever created will prosper against you. No terror or terrorist can bring anything against you. Because God is with you when you serve Him and you know. Let's document that. Um, 
Verse 8, In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. That means, that, that's a legal statement, Redeemer. It means kinsman, Redeemer, meaning I have the right to pay your fine. I have the right to pay your bill and redeem you as my relative. All right. Verse 9. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. This is a strong statement. Listen to it. Absorb it. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. That's a promise. Every time, what, what was the promise that he gave Noah that when he saw it, he would know there would never be another flood? The rainbow. Every time you see the rainbow, it's the same as with Noah. When you see that rainbow, it also means that God loves you and he'll never be angry with you. Those that are barren. Barren in what way? Spiritually or Faithful to Almighty God, our husband. Don't whore around with false teachings and the false Messiah. So when you see that rainbow, that's a promise from Him that He's with you, that He knows where you are. Verse 10. For the mountain shall depart and the hills be moved, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. When you walk into that contract of love with Him, you're sealed, friend. You're protected. You're special. But you've got to have the faith to give you the brass horns to stick with that, okay? It's real easy for a human being to doubt. You don't have to, to doubt. He said it. It is written. He meant it. It will come to pass exactly that way. It always has, and it always will. As it is written, so shall it be. Verse 11. O thou afflicted, Tossed with tempest. He knows when you have problems. And not comforted. Behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires. As it is written in the great book of Revelation, 20, chapter 21, verse 18. It's his promise to you. And I will, this is God's promise, I will make thy windows of agates and thy gates of carbuncles and all thy borders of pleasant stone. I'm going to pretty it up for you. And that means, spiritually speaking, that means I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make up for those past works that you've done for me. The ridicule you had to receive for teaching truth. The ridicule you had to receive for making a stand, for being barren, if you would, of false teachings. 13. And all thy children shall be taught Lemed in the Hebrew, taught, I mean, I mean right to the nitty gritty, taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. I told you, this is where it's written that he told you back in John chapter 6, to come read it, to come understand what he was talking about. That when you partake of that bread, his flesh, for the word became flesh, that doubts in your life and troubles could fly away in the night, that if they rose up against you, you knew how to handle it. You know, it's kind of sad that most people, um, and I feel sorry for people, I, I, I know sometimes they can't help it, but they feel that they are God's natural born worrier. And if they don't worry about something, you know, that uh, we're going to be all lost. Well, to worry is to doubt every promise of God. I mean, you're kidding yourself. God says in one place, and I'm digressing again, I guess. Maybe somebody needs it. 
But it, he says in one place, worry won't add one second to your life. Won't. If anything, it takes it away. He said, I know what you have need of, and if you'll just be still and trust me, do my work, and I'll add everything you need onto you. Do you know something? You're looking at somebody that can document that's the truth. It's a living truth. Uh, how blessed we are in this chapel that he's given us, has given us one of the largest platforms I guess now I can say quite plainly, the largest platform uh, in broadcasting in the world. No other organization has the contact that we do. And, uh, and it's not just on a weekend. It's ev we're everyday people. We stay with people every day. Why? Because people need the God every day. Does that mean, are you saying you're God? No, I, we're his friends, though. We're his workers, and we're all a family, and our family out there needs us real bad. That's why God gave us the platform. So um, be taught of God. Be taught of that love. In four, Verse 14, In righteousness shall thou be established. I don't know, are you established, or do you have no point, no anchor, you just drift around, established. Thou shalt be far from oppression. You're not going to have anything to worry about. For thou shalt not fear from terror. There's no terror that's going to bother you. You're smarter than they are. You know what they're up to. You know where to go and where not to go. For it shall not come near thee. You don't have to worry about it. Now, now listen. A lot of people say, well, I, I'm, I'm just frightened. Well, hey, you know, it, it doesn't take a very smart man to know, it, how do I stay out of trouble? Don't buy any used camels from Ahab, okay? I mean, really, that's tough, isn't it? By that, I mean, keep your eyes open, watch where you go, and be smarter than the serpent. God expects that of his children, and he promises you, if you do that, they're, they can't come close to you. So, and I realize that Gravit, Arkansas is not one of their main targets, but, <laughs> but it, and thank God for that, you know. If we keep talking, we might make it that way, though, be that as it may. They cannot come near you, period, because you have his protection, okay? God takes care of his own. You know, I might just slip in here and say, in all the velocity of uh, terror, by that I mean explosions, dunamis, dynamite, TNT, plastic explosives, it's like an Oklahoma tornado. You know, they can tear up a lot, but it's remarkable how few are hurt. It's like a blessing. God t has the ability to take care of whom he will. Do you understand what I'm saying? Think about it. But it's quite simply, you don't have to think that much about it. It cannot, as long as you use this and keep it in gear, it cannot, and you love him, it cannot come near you. You're smarter than it is, okay? Um, so, verse 15, Behold, they shall surely gather together. Oh, they're doing it, all right. Look at Iraq today. I mean, they're going to they're gather, but not by me. He said, I'm not in it. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Why? He's on our side. He is with us. Our gates will never be bothered. It's his promise, okay? Verse 16, Behold, I, that's emphatic in the Hebrew, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an, an instrument for his work, and I, emphatic, have created the, the waster to destroy. Do you know who the destroyer is? That's Satan. What, what am I supposed to gain from that? He's in charge. He's in control. Do you know what a blacksmith is? You know, he heats the coals and takes a hammer and beats stuff. And he says, hey, I, I'm, 
I'm in charge of him making weapons. And here, here comes the warrior, Satan. And he said, I created him to destroy. But what did I just say to you? I just told you that if you're with me, they can't come near you. They're my boys. I created them to correct people and to deceive people that will allow themselves to be deceived. I will not let them come even close to you. You have nothing to fear. Why? Because you love me. You're my mate. I be um, Isha, your husband. And he means that the closest relative you've got. Verse 17. Listen carefully and don't ever forget it. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord, period. No weapon that can come against you will prosper. You know, um, that should give you a feeling of pretty good comfort. It might make you say, uh, maybe I'm something special. No, you love him. Love is such a wonderful thing. Love doesn't make you special only to the person you love. Okay? And then that uh, uh, fact creates a bond and a contract that he takes very serious and he watches over you. And when things get bad, he's going to watch over you closer yet. Hey, uh, now don't anyone ever get to play in this old game of, of challenging God. To say, oh, well, I'm just going to I'm just going to test him out. I'm going to put my foot in the boiling water and see if he protects me. Don't be stupid. Tell me this. If you put your foot in boiling water, what's going to happen to you? You are going to get burned, son. I mean, big time. God doesn't work that way. That's doubting God. And you're, you're testing him. And he'll, he'll let you... Oh, well. God doesn't suffer fools. And he said anybody that listens to a fool is a bigger fool than the fool. Book of Proverbs. So... Use common sense naturally in all things. I'm just shoring that up so that you understand. As an old combat veteran, uh, we train ourselves well. And we always win. Why? Because we're well trained. We know what we're doing. Always know what you're doing. And then God will always protect you. God will always see. So... What was it Jesus said? God's going to teach him. What did he teach you? I'm going to protect you. That's what is written. You don't have anything to worry about. If you partake of the word, then God, through that chain of love, watches over you and protects you. And hey, he's already given you the knowledge of what's going to happen in the end times. I guess I'd have to ask, have you took time to read it? You know, Man only fears the unknown. And if you haven't conquered the word or studied it to where you know what's going to happen, I feel sorry for you. You're without excuse because he wrote this letter to you. Why? Because he loves you. It's your guide. It tells you how to be happy in these flesh bodies. Some people just like to say, I can handle myself. I'll just get out there in that world and show them what a real man or woman looks like. Squish. You know. Um, if you think I'm saying a person shouldn't take some pride within themselves and handle that word easy, that, that's fine. But no, you need the Father. He looks after you. Now, 
back to John, where, who sent us back to Isaiah 54. Jeremiah 31, as a side lesson for anyone that wants to go further, might be uh, interesting to you, and I will drop it there. Book of John, I want to go to chapter 21. Jesus has been crucified. He has been resurrected. And the boys are just sitting around. And John decides, I'm going fishing. This is after, like I stated, this would be after the crucifixion. Now, uh, naturally, uh, Christianity basically is to make us fishers of men. Okay, not fish. All right. But John decides, I'm going to go fishing. Chapter 21, verse 3, let's go with it. Simon Peter, well, it was Peter and John, okay, said unto them, I go a fishing. Of course, he was a commercial fisherman, understand that. He knew how to fish. It's the way he made his living before Jesus told him, Get it, follow me. Uh, uh, they say unto him, we also, we also go with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship um, immediately, instantly. And that they might, uh, and that uh, might um, they, that night rather, they caught nothing. I mean, Zippo. It's, it's dry. Has that ever happened to you in your life? Four. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. So right on the bank over there. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. You've got to understand that he had resurrected and they'd seen him. I think this would be the third time. I could be in, in error on that, but I think that's right. And uh, they were still having a hard time with this, Okay. Verse 5, Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? And they answered him, No. Now, naturally, the lesson from this is what? Don't ever, ever go fishing for men without taking Christ with you. All right? You're not going to catch anything. Or let me rephrase that. You're not going to catch anything worth keeping. All right? Never, never go fishing for men without taking Christ with you. This means like if you have an opportunity to plant a seed. Okay? Verse 6. And he said unto them, um, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find they cast therefore, and now uh, they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Always fish out of the right side of the boat. Okay? Is that literal? Not really. But it means to do that that is right. You know what's wrong. You know what gives you a... It's amazing that you have people that like to go left, 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 left. What kind of person is that that likes to go left, 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 left? Haven't we had enough examples in this for people that are even living now of people going left to know it's the wrong thing to do? I mean, um, there was probably the greatest move forward is in 1917 and 18. Long about the time Lenin just really got stuff together and he wrote a bunch of stuff and dreamed a bunch of stuff and said, everybody's equal. You work and what you make, you share with your neighbor and what your neighbor makes, he'll share with you. I got some bad news about people, friends. We got more people that don't want to work than we do that like to work. 
Okay. Therefore, guess what's going to happen? You know, I'll never forget one time. Am I digressing? No, not at all. I mean, it doesn't take a smart person to have seen in Russia people out grubbing with hoes and shovels, digging a potato crop because the tractor had a flat. Can you imagine that? They were digging the crop and harvesting by hand because the tractor had a flat. Now, what would, what would a free-born person have done? He would have fixed the, dirt, the blessed flat <laughs> and used the tractor to gather the crop, okay? Don't go left, all right? Every, what, what you work for, don't even want something you haven't worked for. I certainly don't, okay? I don't know, maybe that was a blessing that God placed on me. I don't want something I haven't earned. I just don't, okay? And uh, uh, that's been proven out in my life more than one time, okay? So I just, if I've earned it, I can lean back and enjoy it, all right? If I haven't, I feel very uncomfortable, all right? And I, and I, I like it that way. Any, anyway, what is, the, what, is the, what, what is that digression all about? Fish out of the right side of the boat, all right? That's where you find success. Otherwise, if you love losers, because there's not one nation that is successful in it, they're all switching. Verse uh, 7, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus uh, loved said unto Peter, that would be John, of course, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat upon him, uh, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. He was naked from the west waist up, and he girt the fisherman's coat, or, um, instead of putting it on, so he girded it around his waist and hit the water. Got that picture so you understand? He was going to the Lord, okay? And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cupids dragging the net with fishes. I mean, they had a haul. Now watch this. Nine, as soon, now, now let that sink in, as soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. It was already there. Not their 153. It was already there. Not only can you outfish Christ, he can outfish you. And we're talking about catching men, all right? Verse 10. Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. 11. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of Great fishes, an hundred and fifty-three, for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Wasn't broken at all. It's symbolic of, I feel it has more than one meaning, but I, for this lecture I choose the meaning. There, let's say there are 153 types of fish, then there are, one or, there are so many types of man. And Christ gathers them all. If they love Him, they have right to salvation. They have right to love Him and to come to Him. And we thank our Father for that. Our Father is so very good to us that He has married you. You are His bride. There's a wedding going to take place. And that's how much He loves you. He wants you with Him forever. God gets no pleasure whatsoever from losing people. Now that's, that's a sign of love, my friend, because there are some people that are pretty bad. I don't think if it were left up to me, I wouldn't have much trouble losing them. Okay. If they're going to murder kids and what have you, I, I can get rid of them quick. 
I, I, I wouldn't even mind being the executioner on some of them. What a terrible thing for a preacher to say. No, it's very biblical. Okay. Uh, capital punishment is ordered by God. If you've ever, never studied it, you should, instead of listening to a bunch of yo-yos. Why, why does that work? Well, because nobody's going to let them out anymore. God said, send them up to me and don't even feel bad about it. And others will see, and these things will cease happening among you. That's why it's necessary, so that it doesn't happen again. Anyway, um, God loves everybody, and he doesn't take pleasure in zapping somebody. And if there's any hope whatsoever, he wants that hope held out. Now, we're going to one more place to document. God has written the greatest love story ever told. He caused it to be written at the hand of Solomon. And um, that the whole base of this lecture is found in the first four verses of the Song of Solomon. You'll find it just before the book of Isaiah. It's a little short book and sometimes it's easy to overlook. Right before Isaiah. If you open your Bible right in the middle, usually you're at Isaiah and if you um, go right before uh, Isaiah, you'll come to the Psalm, Song of Solomon. Now let's, let's, let me just set the stage here so you understand. Christ is the quarter. Christ is God with us, okay, in this song. And he's courting, because he's in love, with the Shulamite. Oh, what, what does Shulamite mean? Well, have you ever heard the word shalom? In Hebrew, it means peace or rest, okay? And Shula, coming from Shunim, means it's a double resting place. Here's what this little girl is called, okay? Meaning, uh, that's what Father wants to provide even for us. Let's pick it up with verse 1. The uh, Songs of Songs, Shir Hishmerim, Hashirim, rather, in the Hebrew tongue, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, uh, for thy love is better than wine. It's the sweetest thing in the world. Love is. Because, verse 3, because of the savor of thy good ointments, Thy name is as ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee. Speaking, this is the girl speaking to he that courts. Verse 4, here comes the word. Draw me. Draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. This should be translated, that last sentence, it should say, the upright one hath loved thee. Okay, be that as it may, it's fine. But here is that word draw again. Only in the Hebrew, it is mesak. Mesak. And it means to draw me to you, Lord. Through what? Love, of course. The, the reason I wanted to make that point is that our Father loves us and he give, in his teaching, he gives us analogies that we can relate to from our, in, from our own bodies and our own love for a person we love where that we can relate that to him spiritually. That he will draw you, make shake. He will pull you. That's the, that's the tool he uses. And when we study of him, who can fail to but see the reasons we have for loving him more and more and more? Because he is with us more and more and more. He watches out for you. He knows what tomorrow brings when you don't. So he knows better how to protect you. 
So put your life in his hands, utilizing all the common sense you have. You know, this is um, one thing you must always do uh, is know that God expects you to do everything you can and let him take care of the stuff you can't, okay? That's pretty easy to understand, isn't it? He'll take care of what you can't, but you've got to take care of what you can. He loves you a bunch. This little girl was suntanned because she was in the garden. It's a translation. I'm black. She was really sunburned because she was a country girl. The whole thing throughout is the country girl. Uh, speaking. Those of you with companion Bibles, you're helped a great deal because it's hard to keep up through the Song of Solomon, the greatest love story ever told. Who's doing the talking? Okay, You've got to master that. And it isn't necessarily made clear in the English translation, but you're, uh, if, I'm sure the Strong's will, and if it won't, get my work on it. I think it's two tapes, and I make it very clear who's speaking when and what. Okay. God loves you. That's his contract with you. When he loves you, what does he expect from you? Your love in return. Hey, no one-sided trips here with the Father. You don't con him. You don't fool him. So through his word in this letter he has written to you, know him, appreciate him, and love him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege, Father of serving you. Watch over this congregation, Father. Be with all those that are ill. Guide, direct. We ask it in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Now, all the way through, their people received the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit correctly said, my friend, when hands are laid on them and they spake in and tongues. You need to re-answer his question and re-study this subject. I listen to you every day. I doubt you do, my friend, or you wouldn't be that ignorant, okay? Acts chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. What kind of tongue were they given? It wasn't unknown. It wasn't a bunch of jabber or turkey gobble confusion from Satan. It is written, do you believe God's word or man? Okay, let's stick with God's word. God's word says in Acts chapter 2, and as much as you bring it up, that all the people that were gathered there from all over the country in all these different languages, uh, heard them in their own tongue in the dialect in the county where they were born. That is the evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit, not a bunch of turkey gobble, okay? And I'm not saying this to offend anyone. I'm a teacher of God's Word, and I don't like people twisting it. In all these other chapters you mentioned, it was other people receiving this gift of the Holy Spirit were by any language... If you will follow, it will say, and they did, even the Gentiles, as we did on Pentecost Day. Well, what did they do on Pentecost Day? The Pentecost tongue is that it's every language of the world, and it needs no interpreter, okay? And Peter would say in Acts chapter 2, don't be ignorant, this is that spoken of by Joel the prophet. So inasmuch as you bring Joel 2.28 into it, I tell you the same thing. It wasn't 
unknown and you cannot find the word unknown attached to it in any language, even English, even in your King James Bible, you will not find in Acts chapter 2 that it was unknown. Okay? So you need to study your Bible. And hey, but if you want to jabber, it's all right with me. It won't offend me one bit. We can still be buddies and you can still study with me. But I'm going to teach God's word as it is written and I make no apology for that. Okay? Ronnie from California. My question is about the six day creation. You said all the races were created on the sixth day. If this is the case, can you explain Acts chapter 17, verse 26? Acts chapter 17, verse 26 does stipulate in one place that all people were of one blood. But do you know the problem with that? You see, you're not going deep enough. Though. Even, even poor old uh, Schofield, the Bible translator, really respected by a certain language. I mean, even he was sharp enough to catch that. Why didn't you? The word blood is not in the manuscripts. It's earth, clay. He made all men from, from the clay of the earth and then set the boundaries thereof. Come on, get with the program. And I know a lot of people are saying, well, boy, he's really being hard on people. No, I'm not. I love people. And I want them to have the truth. And I teach in love, and I'm out of time. I'm through teaching for today. I love you all. Stick to God's Word and accept it as it is written. And the traditions of men will make void the Word of God if you allow it. Do not allow it. Stay in His Word, and that makes God's day. When you make His day, you're going to receive the blessings. Study as He taught. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. You know what? He will always bless you. Why? He loves you. Now, uh, most important this, you stay in that word every day in it. It's a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.